Schools, can you give me a thumbs up if you can see Jeremy? All right, they're all there. So, okay, well, um, <laughs> we're gonna start this. So hello everybody and welcome to this virtual conference of the Canadian Space Agency. We are happy to welcome today as a speaker, Canadian astronaut, Jeremy Hansen. Jeremy will talk about his work at the Canadian Space Agency and will answer to your questions. Without further ado, I now pass the floor to Jeremy. Jeremy, they're all yours. Okay, great. Well, good morning. So wonderful to be speaking with some fellow Canadians today. Uh, I get a big wave. Great to see all of you. Wish I could join you in person, but this is a great way to, to meet with many of you this morning. I'm calling you from Houston, Texas this morning. I just wanted to spend a little bit of time sharing with you about space, Canada and space, and what I think the future of space is going to look like. And most importantly, what I want you to know by the time we're done chatting and answering questions today is that there's a very bright future in space for you. If, if any of you are interested in having a career related to space, either going to space or working um, for um, companies that are doing things in space, then there are a lot of and really cool opportunities for you. And so learning about space right now is really going to help you out in the future. Just a quick show of hands. How many of you are interested in space? Who think there's cool things to learn in space? Ah, awesome. I, I'm also curious, if we were looking for a Canadian to send to Mars, would there be any volunteers? Would any of you be willing to go to Mars? <laughs> awesome. I love it. That's awesome. Great. Well, we're not going to Mars today. We're actually working on a lot of neat things that are going to help us send people like you to Mars. But right now, what we have in space are six human beings, and they're on board the International Space Station. So right now, while you and I are chatting, they are flying above our planet at 28,000 kilometers an hour, which means they go around it once every hour and a half. So I know all of you have watched a movie before, and if, if you were to watch a movie, it would take you about an hour and a half. So imagine today, after school, instead of turning on a TV show, you floated to the windows of the International Space Station and you looked out in an hour and a half, you would see one time around our entire planet. You think that'd be cool? That is one of the things that I am really excited to do. I'm a rookie astronaut. I haven't flown in space yet, but I'm gonna have, my oppor have an opportunity to fly in space and I can't wait to spend an hour and a half staring out a window and see one time around the entire planet. I just think that's gonna be the most amazing opportunity. And I've spoken with a lot of my friends who've been, been to space, who've been back, to, back from space, and it really is just a, a, a tremendous opportunity. It changes their perspective. So you and I, we walk outside the school or our house and we look up and, and we just see sky we see what looks like a flat earth, but from space, my colleagues look down and they see this incredible blue marble hanging in space that we live on, this sphere, planet earth that is flying through space. And they really get an appreciation for the fact that you and I and everyone else on spaceship earth are in this together, that we have to work together, that we have to do a good job not just to take care of our planet, but also to take care of one another. And I think that's a really important message that my colleagues bring back from space for all of us and that you and I can see when we look at pictures from space. So I'm gonna start taking questions shortly, but just to kind of recap what's going on today, I said there's six astronauts in space and they're international. So we don't have any Canadians in space today, but we will later this year. We're flying my friend, David St. Jacques, He'll be launching to the International Space Station um, either November or December of this year. And then um, right now, the astronauts that are on board are from different countries. So there's uh, astronauts from the United States, astronauts from uh, Russia. Sometimes we have Japanese astronauts, European Space Agency astronauts. So we have all the, in fact, there's a Japanese astronaut up there right now. So we have this international cooperation that's going on in space that's helping us to do what I was saying earlier, to work together to accomplish really amazing things. So what do they do in space? Well, primarily they learn. 
they are doing kind of what you're doing at school. They, we go to space to learn more about human body in space, learn more about our solar system, our universe, to learn more about planet Earth by looking back at it. And so the astronauts are primarily doing science experiments on board the International Space Station. Uh, another quick show of hands. How many of you like to do cool science experiments and learn new things? Yeah. I mean, you would love to be an astronaut because you get to do science experiments in space while you're floating and flying around. So it's really, really cool opportunity. Of course, we can't do science all the time because we're living on board the International Space Station, which is very complex. And so we have to actually do repairs some of the time to keep the space station working, just like you do maintenance in your house. You have to clean it. When things break, you have to fix them. So we do all those things. When a cargo vehicle shows up, kind of like the delivery person, the mail person, we have to unload those vehicles and reload them. Um, and then we do spacewalks if something breaks outside the space station. In fact, yesterday I was in the pool simulating a spacewalk in the great big huge spacesuit. So that's kind of what my friends in space are doing today. Why don't we um, start out with some questions? Who's first? All right, Jeremy, I will uh, do that for you. Well, thank you for your presentation. We will not start the question and answer session because we are sure that the students want, uh, want to talk to you. Students, please head to the microphone. However, don't get too close to the camera because we want to hear you, but not necessarily see your face. So mention your given name and after ask your question, we're going to start this Q&A session with school uh, Mayor Thorpe Junior Senior High School located in Mayor Thorpe, Alberta. So please ask your question. What can you be doing if they are interested in the church? If they are interested in the church? I'm just asking one more time. It was hard to hear. Um, is it what you should be doing if you're interested in working in space? Maybe if I mute my mic while you speak, it'll work. Okay, can you come up here and bring your question? Yeah. What can you be doing if they are interested in the career in space? What can youth be doing if they're interested in what? In a career in space. Ah, perfect. I, I can hear you now. Thank you for that. Yeah, sometimes we have technical difficulties, even when we're talking to the astronauts in space, sometimes it happens. So that's all good. Um, I'll tell you, I, when people ask me that question, I usually tell them these things. Uh, the first one you've already started and you need to keep doing what you're doing, and that is academics. So that first pillar is academics. You have to make sure that you are learning things, new things. And ultimately, I encourage you to find something that you really like to learn about. So when you get to the university level, pick something that's of interest to you and become as, as much of an expert as you can in a field. And by learning to be a good academic, what you show us is that you know how to learn. And that's very important because you're going to be learning your entire life as an astronaut, for example, or as somebody working in the space sector, we're always going to be doing new things and we're going to need you to learn. So academics is the first thing. Um, the next thing is I encourage you to challenge yourself. So um, it's not enough to just be good at academics. You need to go do challenging things. And why, what I mean by that is uh, when I was roughly your age, I joined the Air Cadet program, for example, and Air Cadets pushed me, it challenged me, it, it started to asked me to do become a leader, learn how to become a leader, to speak in front of people. Um, it taught me how to fly. Um, it taught me how to camp. So the aircraft program was great for me because it was pushing me to do new things. 
And some of them I was, I was scared to do. Quite frankly, I was scared to speak to groups of people. I was scared to stand up and be in charge. And so it challenged me. Now, it doesn't have to be air cadets. It could be school organizations, could be sports, could be um, going on camping trips, could be learning, it, climbing, could be anything you want to do. Find something you want to do and then challenge yourself in that area. So that was the second thing. You need to challenge yourself. And then the next thing is, is if I was going to pick a group of people to live in a tin can and send them to Mars, it would be really important that they worked well together. And that means you need to be a good team player and you need to practice starting today, treating other people like you would treat them in a tin can in space. You need to be, you need to work together. You need to be empath, empathic that you you sense what other people are feeling and how you're relating to them. You need to learn how to communicate better. And so start being the type of person that you want people to be to you. That's really important to be a player in space. So um, how well you work as a team, um, your academics and challenging yourself are the three important things. All right, how about- All right, day? Jeremy, thanks for your, uh, your answer. We're gonna head now to the second school. I'm gonna ask to Morphe Elementary School in McKenzie, BC to get close to the microphone. Just like I said before, we don't wanna see too much of your face, but make sure that we can hear you well and please give us your first name. So go ahead, Morphe. Um, as gravity is non-existent in space, is food digested differently? Yeah, really important question. In fact, um, when astronauts first flew to space, this was one of the questions we had was, could an astronaut actually survive in space? What would happen to their food when they ate it? We, were, we knew they'd be able to swallow because we could test that here on Earth. You can put people in an airplane and you can simulate microgravity for maybe about 25 seconds. And so on those flights, we could have people swallow. So we knew that their throat would work, their esophagus would work to swallow the food into their stomach, but we didn't know ultimately what would happen. Um, so a couple of things. One, yes, um, the food ultimately is digested the same way, but um, the, there is something that changes when astronauts go to space, quite a few of us get sick. Uh, when we first get to space. And it's just like motion sickness. Like if you get car sick or sick on a boat, astronauts get space sickness. And we really don't know how to predict it. Not everybody gets sick. Some do, some don't. Some people are fighter pilots here on Earth and they're used to doing topsy-turvy things with their stomach and they never throw up and they get to space and they throw up. Other people get sick in a car and they go to space and they don't throw up. So we don't really know how to make heads or tails of that. But what we do know is everybody adapts. And within a day, certainly within a week, everybody starts feeling great in space. And, uh, and then their food digests normally after that. And we eat a very regular menu, the same types of foods that you would eat here on Earth. Um, of course, it's very important for us as astronauts to eat healthy. So we, uh, we make smart choices with our food. We eat a lot of uh, fruits and vegetables in space to maintain a healthy diet, to make sure our body has the nutrients that it needs because space is very hard on our body. It's really fun to be floating around, but the fact that you're weightless all the time, your bones start to wither away and your muscles start to get very weak. And so we need good energy to try to rebuild those up through exercise. And we have some fun treats on space, not that we never have treats. We definitely eat um, some desserts and things on space in space because that's fun. But we just are really careful to make smart choices, everything in moderation. Great question, though. All right, uh, let's move to the third school, uh, still in BC. We're going to ask a student of Peter Greer elementary school to ask its uh, question. Uh, go ahead, it's now your turn. Just uh, mention again your first name, don't get too close to the camera, and ask a question. Can you speak up a bit, please? We can't hear you. What is your opinion on Elon Musk and SpaceX? If you had the opportunity to collaborate with SpaceX to explore space in the future, would you? 
Yeah, the answer, the simple answer to that is yes. And in fact, we already are collaborating uh, with SpaceX. Uh, SpaceX has really done some incredible things um, to further our efforts in uh, space flight, both for research um, and just satellites that support us here on Earth, as well as human space flight. In fact, I not too long ago, maybe some of you saw their Falcon Heavy launch where they launched that car into space as part of a test. Obviously, launching a car into space doesn't doesn't do anything for us, but you have to if you're going to test a new rocket, you have to launch something, a weight of something. And they decided to do a car, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, it certainly got some really neat photos. But the cool part for me was watching this reusable rocket fly for the first time. It's really impressive. And so when that rocket blasted off, I don't know if you if you saw the video and if you hadn't haven't, maybe your teachers could show you or your parents or family or friends could show you at home. But there was the Falcon Heavy test flight. And what happens is the rocket launches like any rocket takes off. But then as the pieces run out of fuel, instead of crashing into the ocean and burning up, uh, the first two pieces came all the way back to the launch site and landed like two candles coming in and just like watching the rocket launch in reverse just went ahead and landed just like that side by side and it was super cool to see and now they can reuse those rocket bodies they can refurbish them refuel them and fly another payload on those same rockets this is really important for you to understand space is changing the fact that we have reusable rockets now is like airlines do we throw away an airplane after we use it once? No, I'm flying to Ottawa tonight and then that airplane is going to be used tomorrow to fly all over the, all over the countries between the U S and Canada tomorrow. And so with rockets, it's the same thing. We're going to be reusing them now and they're going to get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, just like aviation did. And that means something very important. Now, I want to ask you a question. If, if it's cheaper to get to space because of companies like SpaceX, Blue Origin, Boeing, Sierra Nevada, there are many of these companies doing this now. If it's cheaper to get to space, are we going to do more space or less space? Raise your hand if you agree with me that you think it's going to be more space. Totally going to be doing way more space. If you remember one thing from today, Maybe two things. The first thing was what, what you need to do in your life about um, uh, staying with academics and certainly taking on some challenges and, and being a good team player. But the other thing to remember is this. Space is changing and there are enormous opportunities coming for those who prepare now, who start learning um, and investing in space. And that's a really important thing for you and for our country to be doing. So very cool stuff that SpaceX is doing. We're already collaborating with them. Um, as part of our international space station, SpaceX delivers cargo to the space station. So we already pay them to deliver our cargo and they bring back science to earth for us from the International Space Station. In about a year, we're going to be launching humans on a SpaceX rocket and SpaceX is gonna be taking humans to space station. So is another company called Boeing. They're building a rocket to take humans to space. There's just so much cool change happening in the space program right now. And I'm really excited about the opportunities that we're building for your future. It's a great question. Thanks for that. All right, let's move to another school. It's time for Sperling Elementary School to ask uh, its question. So once again, I'm going to ask you get close to the microphone, speak up a bit so that the other schools can hear your question and Jeremy as well. So go ahead. Sperling, it's your turn to ask a question. Do you hear us? Yes, we can. Okay. How long did it take you know, your, straight, your, your training and studying in order to become an astronaut? Okay, so <clears throat> how long did it take um, training and studying to become an astronaut? Well, I guess it takes. It takes a while because it, right now to be an astronaut, it's not the first thing you do when you're done school. So, I mean, right now I'm 42. Um, I went to school. I became a fighter pilot with the Royal Canadian Air Force. I did that for many years. And then I applied to be an astronaut. 
But I think the best answer to your question is this. From the time it, I, I was accepted as an astronaut, which was uh, almost nine years ago, it took two years to get ready to go to space. Two years of what we call basic training. And then after that, you can be assigned a mission. I just haven't had one to fly on yet um, because we don't have things like the space shuttle right now. I have to wait longer. But I will, um, as soon as I'm assigned, it'll take about another two years. But I would say in the future, when you're talking about flying, I bet you will be training astronauts in about a year and a half to two years from the time you're selected to the time that you fly in space. And during that training, we need to learn to become spacewalkers, robotic operators, space station systems repair people, um, and we need to know how to do um, to work the science laboratory equipment so we can do the cool science experiments in space. So it takes about right now four years to be ready to fly, but I think by the time you guys would be astronauts, it'll be closer to about two years uh, we could train you to fly in space. We're just getting better at it, and the systems are getting better, less complicated. All right, thank you for your answer, Jeremy. We're gonna start this second round of question and we're heading back to Alberta to Mayor Thorpe Jr. Senior High School. So it's now your turn to ask your question. Great, my name is Matt. What is it like to fly a CF-18 fighter jet? And what have you been told about the launch and what will it feel like to be out in space? Yeah, so um, starting off with CF-18, uh, you know, flying any airplane, this is such a cool experience because obviously you get to leave uh, the surface of the earth, fly above it, see, look down and see all that. But flying an F-18 is very cool because it has so much power. You can go straight up if you want. You can go upside down. Um, you can basically go anywhere you need to go or want to go in that airplane. You know, you ever have one of those days where you just look up at the clouds and you're like, oh, what would it be like to like zoom around those clouds and do loops around them? Well, on an F-18, you can, you can do that anywhere in the sky. It has that much power. So it's very, very cool uh, to fly an F-18. Um, of course, we don't just do, use it to do those things. We use it for combat. So when we train for that, um, we, we have a lot of G-forces applied to the body. So when you're flying an F-18 and if you want to make a sharp turn where you turn the wings and you pull the nose like that, um, gravity is pushing you down at up to seven times your, your weight or your mass. So my head, I don't know how much my head weighs. Let's say my head weighs 15 or 20 pounds. Um, well, why don't we use kilograms? So let's just say it weighs 10 kilograms. Well, I, it would now weigh 70 kilograms, plus I got my helmet on. So I've got a really heavy head that I have to hold up while I'm pulling this gravity. Also, that gravity is pushing the blood out of my brain and down into my body. So if I'm not careful, I'll, I'll fall asleep. I'll black out. The blood will leave my brain and my eyes will stop working and then I'll just kind of fall asleep. Um, and so what we do as fighter pilots, we do this anti-G straining maneuver where we kind of tense our body and clench it and hold a breath for a couple seconds, push against our lungs, and we can help our heart push more blood into our head to keep ourselves awake. So it's, it's actually very tiring to, uh, to fly a, a fighter jet like that. It's a lot of physical work. It's kind of like going for a run. So that's flying an F-18. Uh, on a rocket, um, it's very different. You're actually, instead of sitting up like you are in an airplane, you're actually laying on your back. And so the G-force is when the rocket lifts off, it does push you down at maybe three or four times the force of gravity, but it pushes against your chest like somebody's sitting on your chest. So the blood doesn't come out of your head, so you don't have to do a straining maneuver, but it gets harder to breathe. It's harder to inflate your lungs and fill up your chest. Um, a lot of vibration, a lot of power on a rocket launch. Um, all of my friends that have, have been on the launches are just like, wow, it is super, super cool. Best uh, amusement park ride. But the best part is actually coming back to Earth. The capsule, when it comes burning through the atmosphere in that big red flame of plasma, first of all, it looks and feels like you're going to burn up and die. So that's very exciting, of course, all on its own. And then once you get through the atmosphere and you've slowed down as much as you can, the parachutes open on the capsule 
And then you're just swinging around madly as if you're on like a really crazy amusement park ride. And uh, the people that have described that to me just said it's, you just start giggling because it's just so crazy that uh, it just makes you almost just laugh. Um, but it's a really cool ride and the systems are really safe and proven. And so you, you're, you're, you feel like you're going to be okay, but it's just a really exciting ride. And I can't wait to try that out for myself. All right. Thanks again, Jeremy, for that answer. Uh, now let's move back to BC. I'm asking the school Morphe Elementary School to ask her questions. So once again, speak up close to the microphone so that the other schools can hear you. Okay. Yeah, I think you're good. Is Russian hard? Is it possible for you to speak some for us now? So what I said there was, of course, I, I can speak some Russian. Um, it's important to speak Russian because right now we fly Russian rockets. And uh, I find it very challenging to learn uh, another language. Of course, I speak English, French. Um, I'm still working on my French. I still have a long way to go to be a, a, a very proficient French speaker. Um, and I have lots of work to go on my Russian, but at least I can communicate with people in uh, three languages, which really helps me as a world traveler and a representative um, of Canada. And so I'm very grateful that I've learned uh, those languages and that I can continue to learn them through just simple things like reading or listening to the news or speaking to friends. That's very helpful. All right. Thanks, Jeremy. Okay, let's head now to Peter Greer Elementary School in Lake Country, BC. It's now your turn to ask your question. Once again, speak up a little bit so that we can hear you as well as the other schools. Okay, go ahead. Hi, I'm Kyler. Can you tell us about any space, upcoming space exploration missions? Yeah, great, great question. Um, so like I told you about at the beginning, right now we have the International Space Station. And I told you what my colleagues are doing there. Um, but what I didn't really elaborate on is what we're doing for the future exploration of our solar system. And this is super cool to think about. So you know that we sent humans to the moon back in the late 1960s, early 70s. And when we sent humans to the moon, it was the absolute limit of our technology that we could just get humans to the equator of the moon, if you will, some very limited locations on the moon, and then back to Earth with no extra margin to do anything else. Um, now we have better technology. We've learned a lot since then. And we're actually starting to figure out how we're going to build an infrastructure in our solar system. So kind of think of it like the railway, uh, the first railways that crossed continents. Or think about it like airports. We're going to start building infrastructure in space so that we can go from low Earth orbit out by the moon. We can use resources from the moon. We can leave that area. We can go to Mars. We could visit an asteroid. We could go past Mars. Everything that we're looking at building now is with the idea of making it reusable, refuelable. And, um, and so that will make traveling through our solar system much, much more efficient and cost effective, which is very important. We know how to get to Mars right now. We just don't have the money to do it because it would cost, the spaceship would be so big and heavy um, that it would cost too much. And so that's why we're using space station to figure out ways to minimize our mass, make things lighter, make our spacecraft smaller. Um, some cool technologies out there that are going to make it so that you can explore our solar system when you're a little bit older. Um, inflatable technologies. So instead of launching the big, hard, rigid space station, you, you launch a balloon, basically, that's all folded up on itself. And when it gets to space, you open up a valve and you inflate the balloon and then you live inside it. Uh, that's much lighter and you can have much bigger spacecraft when you do that. We have one of those on space station right now that we're testing, it's working wonderfully. Um, another technology, engine technology, some really cool ideas for solar electric energy. Um, and maybe eventually someday those types of propulsion will be used with other power sources. 
um, large, much larger power sources. And what it does, let me give you an example. Right now, if I were to build you the fastest rocket we can build and send you to Mars, it would take you about six to eight months to get to Mars. With some of the new propulsion that's out there, we'd probably be able to get to Mars in about 40 days once, it's, uh, once we know how to use it. So we have a lot of work to do there, but it shows you we're going to be able to travel a lot further and faster uh, in our solar system in the future. Some really neat things to think about. And so when you're creating your future in your head, I want you to realize that don't base it on what you see today. You have to predict all the new technologies and what they're going to allow you to do. And you have to really open up what's possible because all of those things I just talked about and many more are completely possible for you. Very, very cool. All right. Thank you, Jeremy. So let's head now to Sperling Elementary School. I'm going to ask you to get close to the microphone and ask your questions so that we can hear you well as well as the other schools. So go ahead. What would be the next big jump that would allow interplanetary travel more easy? Like what would let it improve faster so we could leave Earth earlier? Yeah, so it really comes down to what I was just talking about and that is engine technology is the biggest thing. Right now we use uh, conventional propulsion which is kind of like what you use in your car. You use fuel and oxygen and you put them together and you light them and you burn them, they get really hot and they push stuff out and that's what makes your car go. Uh, and that's how we use rockets today. The problem is, is that if you want to move, the bigger the, the thing you want to move, so the more people you want to move, you need a much, much bigger rocket. You need a lot more fuel. You add one person, you have to add like 50 <laughs> times their mass of fuel, for, just as an example. So it, it gets out of control really quickly. So what we're looking for are these new types of propulsion. And the one that I was just describing to you, I said solar electric. What it really is is plasma engines. And plasma engines aren't new. They work, but they right now they're very tiny. And what's happening already is we're, we're learning how to scale them and make them much bigger and more efficient, sort of like a jet engine. The first jet engines that were designed were quite small and very limited. They weren't very efficient. They, they worked, but they didn't work all that well. Um, and eventually we learned how to make them bigger and bigger and bigger. And now if you look at a, a jet engine on an airliner, on a really big airliner, it has changed a lot. It's very, very effective. And that's what's happening with engines for space. Uh, the other thing, that's just, that's plasma engines. What about things like warp drives? Like if you're watching Star Trek, for example, is that possible? Well, we're not sure yet. Uh, there are some theories out there that maybe we can learn to bend time or to travel somehow more conveniently through time and space. And so that is an area of research where there's lots of potential that we don't know the answers yet. In fact, there are so many unknowns about our universe. How many of you have heard of dark matter and dark energy? You guys heard of this? How many of you know what dark matter and dark energy really are? Hopefully none of you, I can't see all your hands. We don't know. We don't really know what they are. I, that was a trick question because yeah, you've heard of them and you can read things about them. And there are things that we think we know about dark matter and dark energy, but ultimately we don't really know what they are. How much there is, we have a guess in our, in our universe, but we really don't understand. Um, it, let me see if I can give you some numbers here. Right now, our best guess is that our universe is made up of 5% matter, 25% dark matter, and 70% dark energy. Well, remember I said 5% matter? Matter is everything that you and I know. Everything. You, me, your school, the suns, the planets. Every single thing that you and I have ever observed in science, everything that's in your textbook, is 5% of the universe. And yet somehow now we think the other 95% is either dark energy or dark matter. We've never seen it. We've never observed it directly. We 
just know some things are going on that we can't explain in the universe and 95% of the story we don't even know. Isn't that crazy? That's how much we have to learn. So if, if we don't know 95% of the story, there's a lot of potential out there for new things like learning how to travel through time or warp space time, really cool things to think about. So if that stuff interests you, boy, there's a lot of neat things that you could do to help humanity in understanding 95% of the story. All right, we're gonna start the last round of questions since time flies. So I'm gonna ask uh, Mayor Thorpe, uh, junior and senior uh, high school to come to the microphone to ask your question. What types of scientists or institutions do you collaborate with to do your research? So what types of scientists or institutions do we collaborate with? Really all of them, anyone, everyone. Um, like I already mentioned, it's the International Space Station. So everything we do, we do globally. Um, as, a, as a partner in the International Space Station, anybody in Canada could submit research to go to the International Space Station. So let's say you had an idea that you thought would help Canadians and you needed space to help you solve it. Just say you're trying to figure out something about, who knows, the human body or uh, materials, and you're like, ah, if I could just figure out how to do this, um, I, I, would, I would know the answer. And maybe in order to figure it out, you need to get rid of gravity from the equation. You wanna remove gravity and see, see what happens. And so you could send, you could just apply to send your experiment to space station. So really we'll collaborate with anyone who has a great idea and it's gonna bring value to Canadians here on earth. That's really a cool aspect of our space program is it's, it's not about any one company, it's about how do we make life better here for humans and how do we learn more things that will help us in the future. All right, I'm gonna ask now Morphe Elementary School to ask its questions, so go ahead. Okay, be quiet because they can hear you. Really? What do the space simulators feel like? Hmm. Sorry. We have a lot of simulators that we use to train astronauts. Um, they are, they're all very different. We don't have a room where we can turn off gravity. That's probably the most difficult thing for us to simulate. And so we do it in a few different ways. One way we do it is we put astronauts in an airplane and we have the pilots fly along, pull the nose up like this and then dive the airplane down. And for about 25 seconds, we can experience weightlessness and we can do experiments in that weightlessness and we can just learn how to work in weightlessness. Um, we also have these neat devices, kind of like a climbing harness and you get all dressed up in these harnesses and they suspend you from this rig and so you can be, I could be in this room here and I could be suspended as if I'm in zero gravity. And if I pushed off the wall, I would fly across the room as if I were in space. And so I can learn how to do things like fix things in microgravity or have a drill, put it on a bolt and then start operating the drill. And I can see how it twists me around in microgravity and how I need to compensate for that. And then another one we do is virtual reality. So I, they can put me on a spacewalk in a virtual reality helmet and I can see where I need to go, what everything's gonna look like. Um, but I can't really do anything physically, obviously in virtual reality. So then we have another simulator that I said I was in yesterday and that is called the Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory. But basically it's just a big pool, a huge pool, biggest pool you've ever seen. And we have a model of the space station, full size model of the space station underwater and then we put on our spacesuits as if we're in space and they put us underwater and they can make the spacesuits feel like you're floating uh, in space because they're underwater and they can put weights and foam all over it where they need to to make it act like it's in zero gravity and then you can practice doing spacewalks. So those are a few of our simulators and they all feel different, but no matter how good they are, they're always a little bit different from really being in space. And so astronauts have to be very adaptable. 
so that when they get to space, they can adapt to what it's really like. All right, uh, Peter Greer, it's now your turn to ask your question. Hi, my name is Ashton, and my question is, do we have the right to colonize other planets when we have destroyed our own planet's resources at an alarming rate? Hmm. Yeah, what a wonderful question. And so obviously I can't answer that question. That's a question that we would we really have to, de to debate. We have to have a conversation about that. And no one person's opinion is the right one. We have to listen to one another and decide um, uh, how we should proceed. Uh, but I'll, I'll remind you of this is um, it's always important to reflect upon your mistakes, um, but always most important to move forward and to learn from your mistakes. And so I think the question you're asking is a wonderful way to learn from our mistakes. We have done a lot of damage to our planet Earth. We continue to do a lot of damage to planet Earth and we need to focus on our solutions now. And, uh, and maybe learning to leave our planet is one of the ways that we have learned more about our planet. You know, when you, if you wanted to learn about uh, planet Earth, let's say you're worried about what was in the air. Well, you could walk outside your house and do an experiment there, but how do you know what it's like on the other side of the world? Well, the easiest and cheapest way to do an experiment around the entire world is to do it from space because, like I told you, a satellite goes around the planet once every 90 minutes and can scan different parts of the planet. Over, over a number of days, in fact, over a month roughly, you can scan the entire, you could do your experiment everywhere on the planet. And, uh, and keep doing it year after year after year. So when all of that, a lot of that information we know about our planet, how it's changing and climate change is coming from space because we can look at the data year after year after year and see, wow, there are real changes happening here. What does it mean and what do we need to do? Anyway, that, that's, I'm going on. It's not really answering your question, but I think it's a wonderful question to ask and we should go out when we leave this planet to go to other places, we need to be very cognizant of the fact that, hey, we need to take care of the environment that we're going to. All right, so Sperling Elementary School, you get to ask the last question. Go ahead. Do you age more in space than on Earth? Uh, was it, did you say, do we age more in space? Yes, yeah, exactly. Um, in fact, well, there's, it's yes and no. So uh, Einstein's theory of relativity tells us that the closer we get to traveling at the speed of light, the slower time passes. So there's an interesting thought experiment you could do if you took two twins and you left one here on the planet and you sent another one out into space at really high speed. When the one that went to space came back, they would be younger. Um, and this isn't just an idea, this is true. We've actually proven the effect of time uh, does happen this way by sending really accurate clocks into space on the space shuttle, bringing it back and seeing that the one that went to space was slightly younger than the clock that stayed here on Earth. So in fact, going to space makes you a little bit younger when you get back, but not very much. For someone that goes to space, you're probably talking you know, way, way, way less than a second younger. It's not any different at all, really. Um, but uh, the effects of space on the body, so like I told you, floating around in microgravity all the time is very hard on your body. Your bones start to get weak as if you're getting older. Um, there's cardiovascular effects. So ultimately, astronauts are aging faster in space. Their body is wearing out faster in space, just a little bit but it is happening. And so that's why astronauts really focus on staying healthy so you can combat the effects of space on your body. And you can do that. Um, you can go back, you can come back in really good shape. You just have to work at it. All right, thank you, Jeremy, for your last answer. This concludes today's conference. Thank you to the students of the schools gathered for asking pertinent questions. Jeremy, I think you agree with us. If we point out the, cal the quality of the questions asked by the students who went up to the microphone, right? Yeah. So Jeremy, before we leave, some schools wanted to take a picture of you. 
with the students standing by the big screen. So I would ask the schools to quickly invite their student to head to the big screen and take the pictures needed and give me a thumbs up once it's done so that we can get to the uh, closing remarks. So okay. go ahead. Sounds good. I'll stand by. <laughs> All right, thanks. So a lot of selfies will be taken. <laughs> Okay, Mayor Thorpe, thank you. Thank you for taking the pictures. Morphe, have you done your picture? Can you give me a thumbs up if the picture was taken? Thank you, Morphe. Uh, Sperling, has the picture been taken? Can I have a thumbs up if it's done? Okay, in the meantime, Peter Greer, thank you. And Sperling, I'm just waiting on your thumbs up. All right, that's it. So. Um, in closing, I would invite all the students to say a huge thank you to Jeremy for his time with us and let's send him our best wishes for the future. So you get to, to get to say goodbye. Go ahead. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, Jeremy. Okay. okay, wait, just Jeremy wants to say something. Just one moment. We're going to let him speak. Go ahead, Jeremy. I just wanted to recap a couple important things that I told you about there. Uh, one, space is changing rapidly. Don't make your decisions about your future careers on what you see today. It's going to be completely different when you finish school, and it's going to be amazing. A lot of really incredible opportunities for you in your future with respect to space, if that interests you. And... Ultimately, right now, ask yourself, what do you want for your future? I really encourage you to set some goals. And you don't have to know exactly what you want to be or what job. That's not what I mean. Some of you will know that. Some of you won't, and that's fine. But set goals in your life. I want you to understand that's what we do in the space program. We set a goal to build a space station where we could learn on behalf of humanity. It was a huge goal but it brought a lot of people together to accomplish something amazing. And if you set goals in your life and you tell people about it, tell your friends, your teachers, your family, you will see that people will start to rally around you and will start to help you achieve things that you might think are impossible. So set goals, share them with other people. You're going to see that you are capable of accomplishing amazing things in your life. Just never think that you can't. It's so important to believe that you have that capability. I wish you all the very best. Have a great day. Take care. So long. Everybody. All right. Thank you, Jeremy.